He says, that's not breaking glass. That's an AR-15. I just saw the dude hit the floor. In the wake of the massacre at a Boulder, Colorado supermarket on Monday, a community is coming together to mourn the lives lost. Daryl Forges is live in Boulder with the very latest. Hour by hour, the memorial outside of the crime scene continues to get bigger and bigger. Check out the scene right now of the scene. You can see so many people still out here paying their respects to the 10 lives lost. You see those 10 crosses there. That's in honor of the 10 lives that were lost as well. Now, as people continue to mourn here in Boulder, Colorado, we're learning more about those 10 lives lost from people who knew them well. Suzanne Fountain. She just would light up the room and she was a bright light. Trelana Bartkowiak. Honestly, she is the most amazing person I've ever met in my life. Ricky Olds. She had dreams. She had ambitions. She was one of a kind. A portrait painted by friends and families of some of the 10 people killed in a senseless act of violence that has devastated a community. There's a hole in our family that won't be filled. An investigation is underway into Monday's mass shooting at King Supers in Boulder, Colorado. This is going to take time and we're going to see justice prevail. The suspect, Ahmad Alyssa, is set to make his first court appearance Thursday as questions mount over the motive. I just don't know why he would choose this way to get his point across. Renewed calls for action on guns are resignating from Colorado. We have mass shooting after mass shooting and Congress has failed to act. To Washington, the Biden administration echoing the call. If we really want something that is going to be lasting, we need to pass legislation. While many Republicans argue stricter gun laws are not the solution. With regard to the gun legislation over in the House, I don't think it would address this issue. The mayor of Boulder says an assault weapons ban may have made a difference in his city. I can say this, it wouldn't have hurt um, and probably would have helped. A city now home to growing memorials for the 10 community members lost to gun violence. And speaking of growing memorials, there's another memorial outside of the Boulder Police Department at the patrol car of Eric Talley, the officer who died here on scene while responding to those gunshots that were fired a couple of days ago during that massacre. And his body was also transported from Boulder, Colorado Coroner's Office to Aurora at a funeral home there. And we also will have several candlelight vigils and memorials for the 10 lives lost later on tonight. Live in Boulder, Colorado, I'm Daryl Forges. Thanks, Daryl, for that update. Now to some developments here at home. That's right. The Hawaii Attorney General's Office just released its annual report detailing statewide and county firearm registration for 2020. Now, a record high total of 26,122 personal and private firearm permit applications were processed statewide last year. That's a spike of more than 62 percent compared to 2019. Now, of the 2020 applications process, almost 96 percent were approved, and those permits come Cover more than 53,000 firearms registered throughout the year. We'll have more details on the stats on our HN digital platforms. Now, to the pandemic, the state health department is reporting 58 new cases and three new fatalities today. The breakdown by island shows seven cases on the Big Island, one on Kauai, 22 on Maui, one on Molokai, 24 on Oahu, and three residents were diagnosed out of state. Meanwhile, our special HN panel series continues today. We're hearing from the state's top medical professionals who have been working on the front lines of the pandemic. talk about the vaccines and we have some statistics for you. The state has administered more than 480,000 doses of the vaccination. That's 20% of the population that has gotten at least one dose and that's encouraging news. Dr. Joe Hogard Green, I wanted to ask you the first question. What if we learn more about how the vaccines are effective against these emerging emerging variants? That's a great question, uh, and we are in the early phases of understanding how the variants impact that vaccine uh, and impact us. Uh, the variants right now we are studying, and they're studying them nationally, uh, and there are kind of three categories they put variants in, and th there is variants of interest, variants of concern, and variants of high consequence. There's none that are in the high consequence because we don't know enough. We're still learning as everything we've learned in the pandemic. The variants of concern, there are two of them that are on the island, 
And what they're showing initially is they're more contagious. They can spread faster. So it's very important to us that we get as many people vaccinated as rapidly as possible. Uh, because we do believe that the, the vaccine does help reduce in the intensity of a disease. So the faster we can do that, the better from my perspective. Right, and a follow-up question. We know of at least one local healthcare worker who got vaccinated, traveled, mm -hmm. and then tested positive. Have we learned any new information about how people who've been vaccinated then got infected? Was it from these variants? Uh, we're not sure at this point uh, whether it's from the variants. Uh, all along, one of the, the issues with vaccines is we weren't able to tell whether you would get the, the disease and be asymptomatic. So one of the reasons we've said wear your masks even when you have been vaccinate, vaccinated is we don't know if you can get it or spread it. What we know is there is some percentage of a chance that you could get the disease and that you could spread it. So right now it appears that in most cases when that happens, that it's a very low intensity of the disease. It's keeping you from getting very, very sick or needing to be hospitalized. But again, this is an area that is rapidly developing. We're studying it just like we did at the beginning of the pandemic. I would definitely recommend getting your vaccine. I believe it's one of the strongest ways that we can fight the battle. Don't miss the pandemic a year with coronavirus. That's tonight at 630 on KGMB and K5, plus on all your H&N digital platforms. So a lot of people are talking about this online. A concert over the weekend on the west side drew hundreds of people and many were seen not wearing masks. Lacey Denise has those details. Large events like concerts aren't allowed right now and social gatherings on Oahu are limited to 10. But on Saturday night, about 500 people jam into a hut on White Anai Valley Road to listen to Grammy-nominated rapper Sway Lee. The concert promoter says temperatures were taken at the door. Despite the massive amount of people, he doesn't believe there were any health and safety concerns. It was, it was cold people in there who wasn't wearing masks. You know, we rock stars, so like, we want people to see our face and see us lit, and then they want to do whatever we do. So they see us without a mask, and they want to be like, okay, we don't have to have a mask too. We, if we all test, if we all if we all negative for COVID, then we all just partying and having fun because we've been so stuck in the house. We haven't been able to go out and do stuff. So it's like this is the first time we feel like we can we can come out and do stuff. Anyone have any concerns about this event being like a, a super spreader because we are still in the middle of a pandemic? Um, I, I don't think we was really planning it to be like that. I don't think we had that in mind. I think we was mostly thinking like. Man, we just want to rock out and have fun, bro. We, we tired of being stuck in the house and have to follow these procedures and having to wait till things reach different tiers. We were just like, man, we young, we wild. We just want to go out and have fun. So that's what kind of we did. One witness told us police checked out the event. It's still unclear if they took any action. Josh Hawley told us that his group is planning more parties in the coming weeks. For This Is Now, I'm Lacey Denise. Scrapping its pandemic policy on boarding passengers in smaller groups, Southwest Airlines has resumed its traditional boarding procedures. The nation's largest domestic carrier, which doesn't assign seats, began boarding passengers in groups of 30 on March 15th. It had been boarding passengers in groups of 10 since it unveiled its Southwest Promise health and safety protocols back in May of last year. A company spokesperson says Southwest customers are familiar with the airline standard boarding style and expect the normal boarding process as they start flying again. Southwest is not the first airline to revert to pre-pandemic boarding procedures. In early March, JetBlue stopped boarding passengers from back to front and resumed its traditional boarding procedures by groups. United and Delta still have pandemic boarding policies in place. American Airlines never changed its boarding process. Travel is now showing strong signs of life as more Americans are vaccinated. U.S. airport passenger counts have topped 1 million a day for 12 consecutive days. Here at home, the TSA says people flying out of Hawaii should arrive at the airport more than two hours before departure. 
There are crowds because of spring break, and on Monday, more than 18,000 people flew into the state. Honolulu police are still looking for the suspect involved in a shooting early this morning that left a man seriously injured. Officials said it happened around 1.50 a.m. near Kinao Street and Ward Avenue. Emergency medical services treated a 23-year-old man for a gunshot wound to the left buttock area, and he was transported to the hospital. A portion of Kinao Street was temporarily shut down during the investigation, but all lanes have since reopened. The state's police union will be negotiating contracts soon, and there are concerns over transparency over those talks. Nick Gruby from our media partner, the Honolulu Civil Beat, is looking into this. I read the article, and I find interesting is how this really affects everyone, though there isn't always a lot of talk about this. Uh, that's right. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. Um, uh, union negotiations happen every few years. Um, and one of the things that uh, is, I guess, not unique about this in, in Hawaii, but it, it's pretty common across the country, is that a lot of the discussions happen behind closed doors. Um, and why I decided to write about this year's negotiations for a new police contract is because there has been a lot of discussion, both locally and nationally, about the need for police reform. And experts, politicians, and others uh, seeking reform from around the country have said that union contracts really are the next frontier when it comes down to holding problem police officers accountable. Now, what do we mean about problem police officers? We're talking about officers who regularly get into trouble or who um, continually have problems when it comes to uses of excessive force. Obviously, over this past summer, we, we we learned a lot about this in the wake of uh, George Floyd's killing in Minneapolis, which sparked nationwide protests. And again, an, a renewed push to look into these union contracts. You know, you talk about these negotiations being behind closed doors. What they negotiate, how does that affect the ability for us to make sure that police officers are accountable when they do the wrong thing? Well, the negotiations are, are, are on one side of that equation, and then there's what happens when police officers get into trouble and whether or not uh, the public gets to learn about that. Um, and so on the negotiation side, what we don't get to see is how politicians uh, from the mayors, the various mayors, administrations, or the state officials are sort of dis having discussions with the union over issues that might be in the contract related to items such as the destruction of officers' police um, misconduct records. Now, this is something that is in uh, the Hawaii Police Union's contract. It requires the departments to get rid of this so-called derogatory material after a certain amount of time. Now, how does that hurt the public? Well, if a police officer uh, gets into trouble say five years ago for something that they're now being accused of a similar form of misconduct now, we might not get to know about that. And in fact, the department might not even be able to use that past, um, th that past behavior when determining how to respond to the new incident of misconduct, uh, which, which can uh, ultimately result in a police officer who might not um, deserve being on the force, who might not deserve having a badge and a gun anymore, uh, being back on the streets and uh, doing the same job. Yeah, it's a complicated issue. We're just really scratching the surface, but you can read the full article at civilbeat.org or you can text 66866 and get the entire newsletter. Nick, we appreciate your time coming to us from D.C. Developing news from the Asia-Pacific, U.S. officials say North Korea fired two short-range missiles over the weekend. Washington is downplaying this latest activity. Janice Mackey Frere has more. This is the first provocation by North Korea under the Biden administration, and President Biden appears to be downplaying it. He said it's business as usual for the Department of Defense and says there's no new element here that would raise alarm. We have learned that there's nothing much has changed. 
In fact, some senior officials are cautioning against hyping it up, saying the Biden administration is still reviewing its North Korea policy. But when North Korea fires anything, it does stoke some tension in the region. South Korea says it monitored the test in real time. The U.S. did as well. So far, it doesn't appear to have violated any of the U.N. protocols because it's weapon systems at the lower end of the spectrum that aren't covered by U.N. bans. Washington instead seems to be using this as a chance to publicly remind Pyongyang that it remains open to discussions. North Korea has rejected any overtures by the U.S. behind the scenes, calling them, quote, a dirty trick. They also slammed the recent joint military exercises with South Korea, accusing the U.S. of raising a stink, even though the exercises were scaled back so that there could be the opportunity to restart talks, which have gone nowhere in the past two years. So downplayed or not, this does seem to be another warning to the U.S. that the Biden administration could see a new front opening in Asia with North Korea looking for leverage. Janice McEfrayer, NBC News, Beijing. Hundreds of vaccine doses shipped to Hawaii were never used. This time, Maui Health says nearly 1,400 vaccine doses were wasted after a refrigerator door was not sealed correctly. The Pfizer doses were stored in an ultra-low temperature freezer at Maui Memorial Medical Center. The problem was found Monday. Workers then called Pfizer, who told them the vials needed to be thrown out. The state says more than 8,000 doses were wasted in various incidents across Hawaii since mid-December. Most were due to a broken vial or syringe. Maui Health tells us it has sufficient vaccine supply to continue current and future appointments. West Oahu residents will have an easier time getting vaccinated starting today. Casey Lund reports. This is a really exciting day for folks on the west side as Queens opens their second mass vaccination clinic here at the West Oahu facility. Earlier this morning, they had a blessing here around 630 for the clinic. I want to give you the details right away. This clinic is going to be open every day of the week except for Monday from 730 a.m. to 7 p.m. You can go to covid.queens.org slash vaccine to sign up for an appointment. Now, they've already booked as of yesterday afternoon, 2,300 appointments for this clinic. But Queen stresses that you can always call the number 691-2222 or visit that website again, covid.queens.org slash vaccine to see if somebody had to reschedule an appointment or had to cancel for some reason. Some of those slots may open up, but that just goes to show you the demand here on the west side. Earlier this morning, we spoke to Dr. Ron Kuroda about what it means to be able to give this really important drug to people, especially Kapuna out here on the west side. Hearing about the need, especially the Kapuna, like you said, that don't want to go into town, and the fact that we were able to get allocated vaccine to be able to provide to West Oahu, it is such a blessing that makes us feel good here at Queens. I myself got vaccinated in December, and it's been great. I take care of COVID patients last week, Wednesday, yeah. had a real sick one, and it made me feel a whole lot better. Um, my parents take care of my kids, um, and so they're elderly, and for me, it makes me feel like they're safer helping out. One other thing to let folks know about parking here at the West Oahu Clinic is free. Queens has done a really good job of getting people in and out. They have a great system here. Again, uh, 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day, uh, except for Monday here at the Queens West Clinic. In total, the Queens Health System has vaccinated now more than 110,000 people in Hawaii. Now back to you. Thanks, Casey. And do I really have to say it? I think I have to say it. What? Yeah, but let me take you outside first. We are talking about more rain. Oh, no. no. Yeah, that's what I'm being told by Mr. Hoggy as we take a glance outside from our downtown tower cam. You can see it looking a little gray and misty. It had been looking rather pleasant for several days. Let's turn it over to him for the very latest on that forecast. How's it on this Wednesday? We're tracking a cold front that's approaching the state and, and that could trigger some minor flooding. Maui County and, Oahu, and the Big Island likely to get the rain maybe later by tonight. And those winds are shifting ahead of that front, southerly winds across most of the state, and that's going to help bring in that moisture from the south. 
Now, as far as the surf, we're looking at a building swell for north and west shores peaking this afternoon with near advisory wave heights. But keep in mind, with the winds coming from the south-southwest, conditions are less than ideal up there. It's very choppy on the south shore. Just forget about that. Better conditions on the east side where the waves are dropping. So we've got this front due in today with increasing clouds and showers. Some of the showers could be heavy at times. Some of the rain will linger through Thursday, slowly easing up on Friday. And over the weekend, look for increasing trade winds. Keep it here on Hawaii News Now. We'll have all your severe weather updates. All right, get ready for an out-of-this-world version of From the Feeds <laughs> yep. today, truly. I'm going to get us started here with what's happening on Mars. And we've been talking about this for a while here at This Is Now, but it's all about to happen. Next month, NASA and the Ingenuity Mars helicopter will attempt its first powered flight. Before the historic flight on Mars, it, the little chopper will have 31 days to conduct a series of test flights. The first flight involves a helicopter lifting about 10 feet off the ground for about 30 seconds. After that, flights will be longer, hopefully, if it all goes well. Now, flights on Mars are difficult because of the atmosphere. It's way thinner up there, so it's really a test to see if things can fly like they do here on Earth. So we'll just have to wait and see how that all develops. I'm super excited and I'm also excited about even more space news. That's right. Ingenuity looks a little fragile, so hopefully it's okay. <laughs> it so can this do is, it. <laughs> this is really cool. Scientists are seeing a black hole in a new light. So scientists observed Povehi in polarized light to study its magnetic fields, how matter falls into it, and how energy is ejected in massive jets. Now, they did so using the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope and the Submillimeter Array on Mauna Kea, along with a network of other telescopes around the world. In 2019, Povehi became the first black hole ever to be captured in an image. In the Hawaiian language, Povehi means embellished dark source of unending creation. And what an image I there. Know, that is gorgeous. gorgeous. Super cool. This is also very cool. A high-tech company, one day soon, says cyclists won't have to worry about flat tires. Now the tire company called Smart Tire is showing off its metal tire, that's M-E-T-L. Metal stands for, here we go, martensite elasticized tubular loading. And Whoa. these tires do not need air to stay filled and can be used on roads, gravel, or mountains. Now the tires use an elastic memory alloy that holds its initial shape they work like the tires roaming around Mars on the rover. So in fact, Smart Tire admits the space agency's technology made this all possible and the tires could be available for the cycling community in early 2022, but no word on price. We're not done yet with our space news. Dozens of bottles of French fancy wine were blasted into space. They've returned. Scientists are pouring over <laughs> what, what they learned. Here's Tina Krauss with more on that. Houston on two. All of physical separation visually confirmed. The International Space Station carried 12 bottles of Bordeaux for a year, not for astronauts to sip, but for scientists to study. The fine wine was packaged inside steel cylinders and remained uncorked until it landed back on Earth. The $6,000 a bottle red is being sniffed, sampled and studied and experts say the bottles that went into orbit taste smell and look different than those that stayed on the ground the one that had remained on earth for me was still a little bit more closed a bit more tannic a bit younger the mission focused on how gravity and oxygen affect fermentation, bubbles, and the aging process. The mission organizer says gravity creates tremendous stress on any living species and accelerates some of the natural progression. Researchers found weightlessness didn't ruin the wine and seemed to energize grapevines brought on board. Snippets of Merlot and Cabernet vines grew faster than those on Earth, despite limited light and water. It's too early for scientists to know why, but they say the cosmic conclusions could start the countdown for grape growing and winemaking in space. Tina Krause, CBS News. I'd sample some space Same. wine. Yeah, why not? $6,000 though. Hey, how about that? That's before it went to space. Yeah, I know. Now it's worth <laughs> a lot more. Yeah. You guys, that's it for This Is Now. We'll be back tomorrow. You guys have a great afternoon. Ashley's going to be back at 4 o'clock.